Okay, good evening, there we go, that's better. We love this new technology. Welcome to the 29th Annual Scylla Lecture. My name is Jane Kirtley, and I'm the director of the Scylla Center for the Study of Media Ethics and Law, which is based here at the University of Minnesota in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. We are so happy that you have been able to join us here tonight. This year's lecture topic could not be more timely. Increasing government secrecy and the growing threat it poses to the free flow of information to the press and to the public. Our lecturer, David A. Schultz, will describe the factors that have created the situation and explain the reasons why we need a new approach to government transparency. But more about David in just a moment. First, we want to celebrate a very special event. This is the 30th anniversary of the founding of the Scylla Center for the Study of Media Ethics and Law. The Scylla Center was established in 1984 with a generous endowment by, from the late Otto Scylla, who was former president and publisher of the Minneapolis Star and the Minneapolis Tribune, and his wife, Helen. Helen is with us tonight, along with her children, Stephen and Scylla and Alice Ryman. Helen, we are so grateful for Otto's vision and your continued support during the past 30 years. Thank you. As many of you know, the Scylla Center has been the vanguard of the School of Journalism and Mass Communication scholarly efforts and public outreach in media law and media ethics for many years and has achieved international recognition for its work. It's an active resource for the courts, for the policymakers, for media practitioners and scholars, and writes friend of the court briefs, uh, provides testimony to state and national legislative, administrative, and judicial bodies, and provides commentary and analysis to several international commissions. Our three times a year newsletter, the Scylla Bulletin, covers emerging issues in media law and ethics. It's researched and written by our Scylla research assistants. Copies of the bulletin are available outside the auditorium and please pick one up on your way out. Scylla funding has supported the work of dozens of graduate and law student fellows and research assistants throughout the years, many of whom have found teaching, uh, can be found teaching and conducting research at leading universities and at practicing at law firms around the country. Our current uh, Scylla RAs, all three of them, have been instrumental in ensuring the success of tonight's event, and I would like to thank all of them for their efforts, Casey Carmody, Alex Placides, and Sarah Wiley. Every year, the Scylla Center offers programs that draw the public into an ongoing discussion about ethical and legal issues facing the media. Tonight's lecture is the 29th in the series that has become the Scylla Center's signature event and provides a platform for distinguished and innovative thinkers from journalism, ethics, and the law to share their insights and expertise. It's been a wonderful 30 years, and tonight's lecture follows in that tradition of excellence. Our lecturer tonight will reflect on another, less auspicious anniversary the 25th anniversary of a U.S. Supreme Court decision in a Federal Freedom of Information Act case, the Department of Justice versus the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I must tell you that in my former life, I was the executive director of the Reporters Committee, and it was on my watch that we argued and lost this case before the Supreme Court. I regard this case as the proverbial albatross around my neck. As our lecturer will describe, the case allowed the federal government to refuse to disclose criminal history records maintained by the FBI in a centralized, computerized repository on the grounds that doing so would invade the privacy of the individuals named in them. I hasten to add that the records that we sought were available to the public at their source, police stations and courthouses, mostly in the state of Pennsylvania. We wanted to review them to determine whether the Pennsylvania State Crime Commission had been accurate when it claimed that a family of government contractors were operating a legitimate business, but one that was dominated by organized crime. Rather than take the state agency at its word, we wanted to look at the underlying records. Unfortunately, much to our surprise, the Supreme Court ruled that disclosure of these digitized records would violate privacy. It reasoned that the effort required to retrieve the records from traditional sources like file cabinets and booking sheets had created an expectation of privacy for the subjects of the records. This was the beginning of a doctrine that has come to be known as practical obscurity. A second aspect of the case was the court's assessment of the purpose of the Freedom of Information Act to allow the public to find out, quote, what the government is up to, close quote. 
This ruling meant that the government agencies could and have argued that unless a record would directly inform the public about government functions, it would not serve the core purpose of FOIA to disclose it, especially if there was a countervailing privacy interest. In the 25 years since the Reporters Committee case was decided, we've seen it used to justify restrictions on access to digitized records at federal and state level, including here in Minnesota, and not only for the executive branch, but for the judicial branch as well. We've seen a similar concept develop in Europe, known as the right to be forgotten, which could force search engines like Google to delete links to truthful online material that the subject of it no longer considers to be relevant, whatever that means. Add to that concerns about national security in the post-9-11 environment, and we have a pretext for virtually unlimited secrecy, and I would argue a recipe for disaster. In part because of the Reporters Committee legacy, transparency to government is an all-time low. The Federal Freedom of Information Act and state access statutes simply are not fulfilling their promise of providing the public with a presumptive right of access to government records. And so tonight's lecturer will argue that what we need is a new approach to government transparency based on the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. David Schultz is a partner with the law firm Levine, Sullivan, Cook & Schultz in New York City. He's also the co-director of the Media Freedom and Information Access Clinic at Yale Law School. For more than 30 years, he's represented media clients including the Associated Press, the New York Times, and London's Guardian in cases involving unauthorized disclosure of government information by and to WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden, among others. He's also been an ardent and tireless advocate of the rights of the press and the public to attend the proceedings at Guantanamo Bay and is currently representing several news organizations seeking to force states to disclose information about the drugs used in lethal injection. I can't think of anyone more qualified to discuss these topics tonight than our lecturer. Please join me in welcoming David Schultz. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Um, it's really a privilege uh, to be here tonight to talk with you about what I consider one of the most important issues we could all um, consider as a nation, and that's your right to know what the government is doing, what we call legally your right of access to government information. And it's a particular honor to be here on the 25th anniversary of the um, Reporters Committee case, which, as Jane has already said, um, is one that she can take full responsibility for. Um, <laughs> Jane, Jane very ably uh, led the Reporters Committee for many years, and she had many great successes on behalf of the press in that role, um, but this was not one of them, as you'll find out. But Jane, you do have to stop beating yourself up for that loss, because who knew that 15 years later, Favish would come along, which really closed the door on access, and we'll, you're going to know what this all means by the time we're done tonight. Um, but, but the state of the law, as Jane said, is kind of a mess. It's also an honor to be able to um, be here and give a talk that's named after um, Otto Sillo, who, uh, as many of you may know, was on the AP board. He served on the AP board for a number of years. Um, he actually went on the AP board in 1978, which just happened to be the year that I started practicing law uh, and started representing the AP. Um, and he served on the board till the mid-1980s. So his, his career on the AP board um, conveniently spanned a very critical period uh, in terms of access rights that we're going to be talking about. It ran from the dawn of the Freedom of Information Act, which was really adopted for, in the form that it's in now in 1974, through the creation by the Supreme Court of this new right uh, called the First Amendment Right of Access. And many of you who may not have heard of that, hopefully by the time we're done tonight are going to realize that's a very important right um, that was first recognized in 1980. Um, so it was a remarkable period of, tonight, uh, of time, and tonight you're going to be getting uh, a little bit of history about that time, uh, and probably more law than you would care to listen to, um, but it really is important, I think, to understand the legal structure uh, and to understand your rights under both the Freedom of Information Law and uh, the Constitutional Access Right um, to see kind of the, the situation we're in today and, and how we can proceed from here. Um, the level of, of transparency that we all take for granted is, is built on these legal rights, and they are intended to guarantee that we'll know what our government is up to. You know, all the other rights that we have in the First Amendment, the right to speak, the right to petition the government, the right to uh, freedom of the press, to publish, 
um, all of those really don't mean a lot unless we have access to information about what the government is doing. Um, so I think it is really important. Um, yet I know when a lawyer gets up in front of you and starts talking about government transparency and the freedom of information law, um, probably your eyes start to glaze over and you wonder why you're here. Um, but hopefully by the time we're done, uh, you'll know it was a good idea to be, a, to be here even if you're missing the Royals-Angels game, which is gonna start soon, I think. Um, <coughs> But you know, very little attention is paid to these rights, e even in law school today. Um, and the Silla Lectures, Jane, I should point out, you mentioned that this is the 28th, I think, Silla Lecture, 29th. Um, and by my count, in the prior 28 lectures, 17 of them have dealt with legal topics unrelated to not ethics and journalism topics. And of those 17, there have been, again, by my rough count, 13 that deal with constitutional principles uh, and how they affect your right to speak, like libel law and privacy law um, and restrictions on content, violent video games. Two more uh, have dealt with national security and prior restraints, and two have dealt with issues surrounding um, reporters' privilege. But until tonight, there hasn't been a single Scylla lecture on the right of access, and thank God we're finally addressing that oversight because it really is an important issue. You know, just recently, um, a University of uh, Virginia law professor, um, Fred Schauer, gave a speech commenting on this, this issue and, and the similar failing in our, court, in our law schools, um, which teach all these other First Amendment rights, but just kind of gloss over this whole idea of freedom of uh, uh, access to information, freedom of information laws, and the constitutional right of access. But they're really critical. Uh, as he said, all other components of the protection of speech do not mean much if we as citizens do not have access to the information that is itself essential for informed debate to take place. So before we finish this evening, um, I hope you'll appreciate this a little more. I was just gonna ask how many people in the room are journalists or journalism students? Okay, so, so this is gonna be a little unlike other lectures because you're all gonna get an exam at the end, so you can take notes. And are there any lawyers in the room? Uh, uh oh, <laughs> hi John. Um, anyway, there, there's going to be a lot of law and, and what I'm gonna try to do is, is give you the legal principles um, that are important, um, but give you some of the context for them and some of the facts so it doesn't get too dry and boring and at least I hope I can keep you awake for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, one of the clients I've had uh, the privilege to work for uh, in the last couple of years that has been really fascinating, as Jane mentioned, is The Guardian um, US and, and one of their reporters, Glenn Greenwald, um, who broke the story, as many of you know, about NSA surveillance uh, that was disclosed by Edward Slo Snowden. Um, and maybe some of you remember, this, this is um, a document, a simple document that was posted on The Guardian website uh, in July of last year, along with a report by Glenn that the NSA was collecting metadata of all phone calls in the United States pursuant to warrants that had been secretly issued by the phone companies uh, and the warrants had been issued by a secret court um, that had been set up back in the 1970s really to, um, to act as a, a, a court that would monitor and oversee foreign intelligence gathering activities. It was done uh, in 1976 as a result of the Church Commission and Congress was trying to separate out so that the U.S. intelligence gathering agencies weren't doing things in the United States. So this document, which on its face um, essentially said, it, it authorized um, the NSA to collect from the phone companies the metadata from every phone call that went over their systems in the United States um, for a three month period, set off uh, real shock raids. Um, at first, it was a story based on a confidential source, um, but that changed very shortly into the story, about four or five days later when the source um, outed himself, and you probably all know um, by now Edward Snowden. Um, many of you probably remember this clip that I was going to show you. We're having a little audio-visual problems here, but this was a clip that, that appeared on Sunday after that first story. Um, and at the time, uh, the things that Snowden had to say were questioned by many people, including um, some senior members of the House Intelligence Committee who said he didn't know what he was talking about, that the government could not possibly be doing these things and that he wouldn't be able to back up what he said. And um, I'll see if we can play just a piece of it. I'm not Talk sure it'll work. Talk about how the American surveillance state actually functions. It, does it target the actions of Americans? Uh, 
NSA and the intelligence community in general uh, is focused on getting intelligence wherever it can by any means possible that it believes on the grounds of sort of a self-certification that they serve the national interest. Uh, originally, we saw that uh, focus very narrowly tailored as foreign intelligence uh, gathered overseas. Now, increasingly, we see that it's happening domestically. And to do that, they, uh, the NSA specifically, targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default. It collects them in its system and it filters them and it analyzes them and it measures them and it stores them for periods of time simply because that's the easiest, most efficient, and most valuable way to achieve these ends. Okay, so, so that, that's just to kind of take you back to the time of it and, and to remember this really was like a bombshell. And um, what did we actually learn from Snowden? I mean, after these disclosures and, and the kind of the disbelief, the documents that he turned over to The Guardian and to The Washington Post revealed a massive system of government surveillance that was not only capturing the metadata that we saw in that first thing, but the, vir the, the content of, of virtually all email that went over the internet, um, uh, what people were communicating on social media they were picking up, virtually everything that you did on the internet was being tracked and followed. Um, even where you were lo located was being tracked through your cell phones. So all this we learned through a whistleblower, through a government disclosure. Snowden pulled back the veil on activities the government had been doing that we knew very little about and which the government had worked hard to keep secret. And at this point, there can be no serious debate about the importance of this information to us as a society or to the world at large um, and, and to our ability to make decisions about what kind of government we want and to make those decisions democratically. I mean, just the immediate reaction over the first few months um, led to all sorts of, of reforms and questioning. People started to question uh, information about what privacy rights we have, uh, both in private industry uh, and in the government, um, uh, reactions to, to this information. Um, it even caused uh, people to rethink how the Internet is being governed and who should govern the Internet. So you might ask, you know, why start with the Snowden disclosures in a talk about access to government information? Because um, we're not going to be talking tonight about um, the potential criminal liability of reporters like uh, Glenn Greenwald for reporting this information, uh, the, the scope of the Espionage Act. We're not going to be talking about the reporter's privilege uh, or even the ethics of reporting this type of thing. Um, but I think the Snowden story is an interesting place to start because it really highlights what I see as the two major trends or the two major um, forces that are limiting access to government information today, and those are uh, national security and privacy. Um, these are, are two issues uh, that are driving the government to keep more and more information um, from, from, the, from the public. Um, questions about personal privacy, particularly in light of of the massive amount of information the government collect, can collect, as the Snowden disclosures uh, showed, and concerns about national security uh, in light of 9-11. Uh, um, and these are, the, these are the things I want to focus on and to get your, draw your attention to, to start thinking about um, how we make decisions about privacy and national security and how much information the public should have about what the government is doing. Um, because getting these, level, these, these issues right, determining the proper level of transparency, really is, is critical to how we proceed um, as a nation. You know, for example, um, the, the issue of what authority does the president have to order strikes of uh, military strikes or targeted killings of citizens, U.S. citizens abroad? Um, uh, what authority does the NSA have to uh, collect information or to listen in on your phone calls. There, there's a whole series of important legal issues that we found out about only after the fact. And what we've learned is that, that since 9-11, there has been the, the, we have developed a whole body of secret law that we didn't know about. And so even the legal basis and the legal theories the government has, has kept from us uh, and that we've been fighting uh, to get that out ever since. Um, and as your senator um, said in a statement not too long ago, um, Al Franken, the government must give proper weight uh, to both keeping Americans safe from terrorists and Americans' privacy. But when Americans lack the most basic information about our democratic surveillance program, they have no way of knowing if we're getting that balance right. 
that lack of transparency is a real problem. So, and I, do, I don't purport in tonight to have answers to some of these issues or to, to any of these issues about the scope of uh, legitimate privacy and national security versus transparency. But I do hope that you'll leave tonight with a better understanding of the issues uh, and a better understanding of the laws that we have in place so that whether you're a journalist or a future journalist or just a, an interested citizen or concerned citizen, you'll have a better understanding of what information you have the right to expect from government and how you can go about uh, getting it. So let's start with just the basic access rights. And, and these may be things you're, you're familiar with, particularly with the Freedom of Information Law. Probably most of you um, have, have heard about it. But there really are two legal bases for demanding information from the government. One is uh, the Freedom of Information Law, the Freedom of Information Act at the federal level. Every state has a, a, an analog to that. Some places, states call them open records laws or sunshine laws. But they're basically statutory rights that you have to information. And the other basic right is, as I mentioned earlier, the First Amendment um, uh, constitutional uh, right of access. So let's, let's talk about each of those just briefly so you get, you get a sense of those. Now, probably most of you are familiar with the Freedom of Information Act because every day in, in your papers, you see stories that are based on information that a reporter got by filing a Freedom of Information Act request. Um, the Freedom of Information Act was enacted um, in the post-Watergate uh, world of Washington back in 1974 uh, after President Nixon resigned and the country really wanted to know more about what was going on in Washington and what the government was up to. So in 1974, over the veto of President Ford, who thought that the act went too far and was going to disclose too much information, Congress amended the law, the, the pre-existing law, in a number of ways that really gave rise to this first uh, statutory right of access. And it does a number of things um, that you should be aware of. The first thing it does, which is most important, is it says that as a matter of law, there is a presumption that every record, every document in a government agency, you have a right to see. You start from that presumption. That was a major change uh, back in 1974. Um, the second thing it does is it says um, that the agency can only withhold information if it falls into certain defined categories of exceptions. And if it declines to give that information by claiming one of these exemptions, it has the burden of demonstrating that the exemption properly applies. And the third important thing that it did is it gave you the right to go to court to challenge what the agency did. Before that, uh, you had no right, no standing, as they said, to go to court and complain if a court, uh, if an agency wouldn't give you um, a document. And these were really important fundamental uh, changes. And the fact that you now had the right to get a judge and the fact that the law said the judge will make the decision de novo, in the legal term, meaning it will decide itself whether the statute applies to the records. It doesn't defer to the agency. So it was really um, a very strong and powerful um, statutory framework um, to, to get information out of the government. Um, now, I mentioned there are nine exemptions. There actually are more than nine in a sense because one of the exemptions is kind of a catch-all. It says that an agency can withhold any information that by statute Congress has said uh, can be withheld. So there are a number of other exemptions. But the basic ones you're probably familiar with. There's, a, there's an exemption that says it can withhold things that are properly classified uh, under the, uh, the national security exemption. It can withhold things that relate to personal privacy. It can withhold things that relate to law enforcement investigations and so on. So there are a number of ways that information is kept back. But that's the basic statutory framework, which you're probably all familiar with. The other, the other basic legal theory you have to get information from the government is the um, constitutional right of access. Um, and just a few years after the Freedom of Information Act was amended, as I said, in 1980, the Supreme Court recognized this right um, for the first time uh, in a case called Richmond, Virginia versus, uh, sorry, Richmond, Virginia, sorry, Richmond Newspapers versus Virginia, um, which came down in 1980. And I say it was a really important case. Um, it was one of those, you know, incredible moments where, where people were surprised at the outcome because the court was articulating what essentially was a previously unknown uh, constitutional right. Um, it said that this right is embedded in the First Amendment's protection of free speech, free press, and the right to petition the government, and that it was implied uh, by the structure of the Constitution that for these other rights to, to function, 
there must be some level of access to government information and to government proceedings that the public uh, has a right to obtain, a constitutional right to obtain, in order for these other constitutional rights to, to exist. So just like uh, the court has said that other parts of the Bill of Rights contain implied constitutional rights, like the right to travel is a constitutional right, the presumption of innocence, if you're prosecuted criminally, you have a right to be presumed innocent. These are all implied rights. They're not expressed in the Constitution. And just like those other implied rights, the First Amendment implies that you have the right to, uh, to, certain, to attend certain proceedings and to compel the government to give you certain uh, information. So now that the court has said this right exists, the next question that the court had to, and other courts had to grapple with is, well, where does the right apply? Um, you know, how do we know if something is subject to the First Amendment right of access? And to address that question, the, the Supreme Court developed a two-part test uh, that we call today, or it's known today as the history and policy or experience and logic, but it looks at two things. Under this test, the First Amendment access right exists to government proceedings and information that one, have traditionally been open to the public, and two, will benefit from public access. So that, that public access has to serve some function in advancing the way uh, that the government functions. As the court said in uh, the Press Enterprise, uh, sorry, in the Richmond newspaper case, that access has to play a significant positive role in the functioning of government. Um, a couple of examples might make that a little easier to follow because it's, it's really not such a difficult concept. In Richmond newspapers, for example, where the court was applying it for the first time, it said, well, how do we know that there is a constitutional right to attend a criminal trial? Well, it said, on, on one hand, we know that because uh, we can trace the history of criminal trials all the way back to before the Norman Conquest back in England, and they've always been open to the public we can find out through history that they always were conducted in public places uh, so that we have this long history. So that's one, one indicia of, a, of the fact that this should be viewed as a fundamental right. And the other is uh, that the openness of the proceeding helps the proceeding itself function. Well, what does that mean? What the court said in that case is that look at the way that, that a trial works better if the public is there. They said one, the, the performance of the people who are involved in that is going to be improved. The judge and the lawyers and everyone else are going to be more prepared if they know there's going to be people sitting there watching them than if they're behind closed doors. Um, and it, the, by the same token, the fact that the public is there protects the judges and others from claims that they abuse their power or that there was some deal struck that might happen behind closed doors. So that's another way that having open proceedings makes them work better. It'll discourage perjury. Right? If someone's going to take the stand and testify, but they know their testimony might be in the paper, they're less likely to lie. And so you, you see how this process works. What, what, to, get, to get the right of access, the, the First Amendment is not a freedom of information law that says you get to know everything the government's doing because that will make you a better citizen. But it says you get, to do the, you get access to those things that traditionally have been open, uh, and in particular, things where your having them will make government function better. That's the way the, the constitutional right works. Um, it's easy to see how that might apply uh, to a, a criminal trial. Let me give you another example to just show you. So this was 1980. The right is first articulated, and there was a big debate on the court about how you limit it. Fast forward to today, um, how is the right being applied and what sort of arguments are being used about uh, compelling uh, information from the government? Some of you may have followed the controversy over lethal injection executions that have been going on. Um, every state that still uh, has the death penalty uses lethal injection executions uh, as the method of, of inflicting death. Over the past five or six years, uh, states have found it harder and harder to get the drugs that they have historically used to do those executions, right? Um, a few years ago, three or four years ago, the European Union uh, made it illegal for drug companies based in Europe to sell drugs to United States corrections departments for the purpose of killing people. And what was happening in these various states with the people who were opposed to the death penalty is they would use their rights under the freedom of information laws. They would go to the Department of Corrections and they would say, where are you getting your drugs and what drugs are you using? They would then put pressure on the drug company or the supplier so they couldn't supply them. And the, the corrections departments were having trouble getting the drugs they need. 
and they were using newer drugs and experimental drugs and going to compounding pharmacists to make the drugs. And you've probably seen the, the results of some of that uh, in the last six or seven months uh, with some very seriously botched executions in Oklahoma, one this summer in Arizona where it took over two and a half hours for the person to die. Um, and this is caused by the fact that these drugs are, are being hard to get. So what happened? About uh, two years ago or two and a half years ago, several states started passing laws exempting the source of drugs from the Freedom of Information Law. So they said, you know what? If you're going to pressure our suppliers, we're just not going to tell you where we get the drugs anymore. This is where the scope of the constitutional right becomes very important. Because if the public has a constitutional right to know that information, then the fact that the state has passed a law saying they can't know it won't matter. So what's the argument? Several um, news organizations, including the AP and the Guardian, um, are in court now in uh, Oklahoma and in, sorry, in Missouri and in Arizona, bringing challenges asserting that the constitutional right of access applies to inf this information. How do you make that argument? Well, first you say, historically, executions have been open to the public, and you can build a record. You can show that all the way, you know, when we had um, hangings and when we had uh, d uh, uh, firing squads in some states, when we used uh, gas chambers, you can document that they were done in open proceedings. And even today, every state that has the death penalty requires representatives of the press, uh, of the public to be there in the form of the press so that we have a history of openness. Um, and then you have to um, articulate the reasons why having the public there facilitates the functioning of that process. And you would do it in the similar ways that was done in press enterprise to show how having the, pres the, the public there ensures that things go better, that you don't have these problems uh, that, that we experienced in the, in, these, uh, in the states in recent years. It's, it's a difficult argument to make, um, and we don't know if we'll be successful in those cases, but there are cases uh, in, in Idaho and in California, courts have already said that the constitutional right of access extends to watching the execution and it seems to me that it's relatively smart, a small step to say it should apply to the execution drugs, but, but we'll see. Um, so let me just say one more word about the, the access right. Now that we've talked about the fact that it exists, you all know you have these rights you probably didn't know when you walked in the door. We know how you figure out where you can argue that they apply. The other thing you need to know is it's not an absolute right, right? The fact that you have a right to, to attend a trial doesn't mean that a trial can never be closed. But again, the Supreme Court has articulated a very high uh, standard for when you can close those types of proceedings. Um, it essentially boils down to two or three things. It says if, you, if someone wants to close a proceeding or deny access to information where the constitutional right applies, they have the burden first of showing that there's a substantial probability that doing something in open or giving some information out will uh, cause harm to some equally compelling right. Remember, we're talking about limiting a constitutional right. So you have to have some equally compelling right. Typically, the fight is someone's right to a fair trial. If we have an open proceeding, we won't be able to pick an impartial jury. That's how it gets played out. But you also have claims of national security as justification for closing things, claims of privacy, a lot of things where jurors want privacy. Um, but, but that's the basic standard, is the first thing is you, you have to show that there's some equally compelling right. Then you have to show that there's no alternative to protect that right other than denying the access right. And if you pass those two things, then you just have to be sure that however you limit the access right, that it's narrowly tailored and it doesn't go along uh, any longer than necessary. Um, so in, in applying those factors in the, in the criminal trial case, which is kind of our archetypical uh, example of the constitutional access right, courts have closed proceedings, for example, where um, a victim of a sex crime is going to testify, but they've never been publicly disclosed. Courts will often allow those to be done in closed proceedings, or where an undercover policeman is going to testify about something that happened, and having them testify in open court would you know, blow their cover. So there are circumstances where the right can be limited. Okay. So now that we have these basic, the legal framework for these rights, let's go back and talk about these two, these two concerns that I want to raise with you, privacy and national security, and how they are pushing us away from openness in government. And maybe we should take privacy first. Um, the, the privacy exemption in the, in the Freedom of Information Act essentially says, there's two of them, but they're, they're basically the same. Um, they, they say that um, 
information can be withheld when its disclosure would constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy, right? And so there's two, two issues there. One is, what is personal privacy within the meaning of that law? What triggers this right to hold information back? And the other is, what is unwarranted? And th the reason um, that the Reporters Committee is so important uh, is because Congre uh, the Supreme Court construed both of those in ways that serve to limit access to information, right? So uh, in the Reporters Committee case, which, which tonight I think we should just call Jane's case because that's simpler, <laughs> but in the Reporters Committee case, the Supreme Court, as Jane said earlier, did this unusual thing. First, it said um, there is a privacy right here even though the information that the Reporters Committee was after is all available in public sources, right? They were after an FBI rap sheet, a summary of, of convictions and arrests and things you could get from other public sources. So, At least if you were going to draw an analogy between the privacy exemption and the freedom of information law and what we would think of as an invasion of privacy at common law, an actionable invasion of someone's privacy, you wouldn't have a claim in, an, in a privacy tort for getting access to information that's available in a public record because the courts would say that's not private, it's public. So the Supreme Court expansively interpreted FOIA by saying, well, you know, even though the reporters could get this information if they took enough time and visited all the courts in western Pennsylvania where Charles Medico lived, the information is practically obscure. And therefore, the fact that it's hard to get the information creates a privacy interest in Charles Medico that the Freedom of Information Law intended to protect. So even though this is totally public information, the purposes of the privacy exemption, it's triggered, okay? So that's one thing they did, is they expansively interpreted privacy. On the other side, the question is, well, what's unwarranted, right? They said, well, in the privacy area, you're gonna, to decide whether something's unwarranted, you have to decide if the impact on privacy is so great that it justifies keeping the record from the public versus the public interest in knowing that information. If the public interest is really high, then the disclosure or the interference with privacy is not unwarranted. It's warranted because the public has a right to know that information. And again, you would think that if the stuff was public, it wouldn't be a big deal. But the Supreme Court narrowly construed the public interest that you're going to weigh against the privacy interest. So it, it created this expansive privacy interest and it said, the only thing we can weigh on the other side to decide whether the information should come out is what the information will reveal about what the government is up to, that that was the only purpose of FOIA. Um, and it said in this particular case, the rap sheet of Charles Medico isn't really going to tell you anything about what the FBI did with that information, how it's being used. It's just going to tell you they collected it, but you know they collected it because they've told you they have a rap sheet. So we don't think it should come out because this interest created by practical obscurity outweighs any interest in knowing what the government's doing with this rap sheet. So it was a rather stunning decision at the time. Um, but as I said earlier, it really got worse uh, in a case a few years later in 2004, the Favish case. And let me tell you a little bit about this case and how these two fit together. And as I say, I apologize at getting a little legally and geeky here. But in the Favish case, um, it, it's one of those examples of, of bad facts making bad law. You had kind of a, a crazy plaintiff um, who had a theory, uh, a conspiracy theory, that um, Vincent Foster, who, who committed suicide, you may remember he was an aide to Hillary Clinton, he committed suicide in the first term. Um, well, there was a conspiracy theory that Mr. Favish bought into that he, wasn't, he didn't really commit suicide, he was murdered by the Clintons, that they had paid someone to murder him, and that the photographs of the murder scene were going to prove the fact that the Clintons murdered Vincent Foster. So he, he made a uh, FOIA request to get these photographs, right? And it was a crazy case. The archives didn't want to give him the photos. The case gets litigated all, to the, all the way to the Supreme Court where Mr. Favish argues personally on his own, which probably wasn't too good either, um, uh, and he lost. But the problem isn't just that he lost that case, but it's the, the legal principle that the court adopted in that case. Because what it said, it, it applied the Reporters Committee case, right? It said, first, is there a privacy interest in these photos? Well, again, it had to depart 
from what we understand to be protectable privacy interests at the common law. At common law, if you die, you lose your privacy rights. You know, you, a, a dead person can't bring a claim for invasion of privacy. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, which would be a whole other topic. But so, so again, the Supreme Court had to deviate from traditional legal notions of privacy and say, well, we think that even though Vincent Foster is dead, the freedom of information law and the privacy that it's intended to protect extends to the interests of its family. And therefore, the family can assert or has privacy interests in not having the um, photograph of their, their relative's dead body being displayed in public. And that's a sufficient privacy interest to trigger the exemption. So once again, an expansive privacy interest. Now, it turns to the other side, and remember the Reporters Committee, the test is, well, is it going to shed light on government? And holy cow, what do you do? You have a plaintiff here saying, if you reveal this, it's going to show that the president and his wife committed a murder and that the Parks Department covered it up. Well, that pretty much says something about what government's up to, right? So you would think, under a Reporters Committee, it would come out. But what happens? They have to come up with a new rule because they don't want to, to let the information out. So they say, well, you know, if you want information because you believe it's going to reveal government misconduct, and that's why you're, you're here asking for it, you have the burden as a requester seeking information from the government to show us that there's some reason to believe that the misconduct happened. And all you have here is your surmise and your speculation. You don't have one piece of evidence that this happened, and therefore the privacy right wins, okay? So that's the ruling of, of Favish. And again, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense in the context of this weird fact pattern. But what does that rule do? What are those principles when you take the Reporters Committee and Favish and you put them together, um, where are we? And let me just give you an example um, of an actual case, um, how this plays out. A few years ago, um, the AP sought some information about Guantanamo uh, detainees, uh, specifically they were fighting about um, allegations that had been, been made by various detainees that they were abused while they were in Guantanamo, right? That both from the guards and detainee on detainee abuse. The AP wanted to know, what did you do about these allegations? What kind of reports were done? Um, what did you conclude? Um, and they wanted the names of the detainees who were making these allegations because among other things, they wanted to see, you know, is there some problem, you know, is, is it, um, the Saudis versus the Yemenis, or is there like nationality issues happening within Guantanamo, or is it religion-based? Um, so they wanted to know who the detainees were that were making these allegations of abuse. Well, the government said, no, you can't have it because that will interfere with the detainees' privacy. That's an unwarranted invasion of the privacy of a detainee who has made an allegation that they've been abused, right? So in the district court, um, the district court said, well, applying the Reporters Committee case. Um, I see that there's a private, there may be a privacy interest, but it's really diminished. And he drew a parallel to people who are in jail here in the United States. He said, in, in, uh, people who are in jail have very diminished expectations of privacy. There's a lot of things we can do to people in jail. Um, so I put very little weight on the privacy side. And on the other side, he said, you know, this is gonna reveal what the government's up to, so I think the information has to be disclosed. On appeal, the Second Circuit looked at these two Favish and the Reporters Committee and they said, well, first, we do think there's a privacy interest here because, as they put it, these are victims of abuse. And if their names come out as having been abused, they may be embarrassed or they may suffer reprisals when they're released from Guantanamo. So they disagreed with the district court. They said, we think there's a privacy interest here. And then they went on to say, okay, so now we have to look at the public interest and there might be some public interest. Um, but they looked at this fact that AP was saying, look, among the things we want to do is to see if, if um, there's a, a problem with different nationalities fighting with each other or a problem with different religions fighting with each other or a different sect. And what the Second Circuit said, applying Favish, is, well, what you're really looking for this information for is to see if there was some type of misconduct in, the, in what the government's doing. Um, and because of that, you're not entitled to get that information under Favish unless you have evidence that there was some problem, either in the government discriminating by nationality or discriminating by religion. So, so you can see from that one example how you take this concept of allegations of government misconduct. Any time that someone asks for information because they want to know what the government is doing, 
is susceptible, at least in theory, and often in fact, to being reframed as, well, you want to know that because you want to know if the government is acting improperly. And if the government's acting improperly, you're not entitled to that information unless you have evidence that they're acting improperly. So we've seen in the privacy area, the courts have turned the statute completely on its head. A statute that was passed to make it simple and easy for people to get access to information about what the government is doing just so they could monitor what the government is doing. Anytime there's a privacy interest broadly construed now is a statute that says you can't get this unless you have evidence that the government's doing something wrong. So there's a significant problem uh, in, the, in the privacy area. Um, and, and as I say, I think going forward, it's, it's a real problem because we have these, these issues of uh, if uh, it, you don't have a, an argument that it's not private if it's in the public record, um, you don't have an argument that it's not uh, private because someone is dead. And what we see is these evolving theories of privacy, the right to be forgotten, which has become a very big thing in England, uh, we're going to have expanding notions of privacy. And when you bring those in and import them into the standard, the framework of, of the Reporters Committee and Favish, we have a real problem in terms of, of uh, knowing what the government is up to in a whole number of areas. Um, so that's one. Uh, let's turn the corner for a minute and talk about national security before I totally put you all to sleep. Um, National security, I, I, I do say that uh, we have to start with 9-11 because 9-11 changed everything. It was like a thunderbolt that went through the, the, the government. Uh, in the immediate aftermath, huge amounts of information were taken out of the public domain. Um, the FAA took off uh, of its website all of its enforcement action reports that talked about airlines and airports. And in fact, it went to libraries and, and physically took copies of those away. Um, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, removed from all of its websites specifications for energy facilities that people use to, for various things. The EPA removed all of its reports concerning chemical accidents, and the Senator for De Disease Controls removed uh, its reports on security at chemical plants. Even the Bureau of Transportation took down all sorts of maps and data and other type of information that was used by environmentalists and others for doing studies on the impact of highways and things. So a great deal of information that was useful to the public was withdrawn for the public in the immediate aftermath of the attack. Now, a lot of these things that happen, um, just as some of the things that this country did after Pearl Harbor, probably in hindsight will be viewed as excessive and unnecessary, and they'll be corrected. What I'm concerned about in this area, though, is the long-lasting legal changes that happened. And a couple of things happened. Um, one is, right after the attack, um, Attorney General John Ash Ashcroft issued a memorandum to the head of every agency that said, you know, from now on, the Department of Justice, as your lawyers, will defend you if you keep information from the public. If there's any possible ground to do it, we're going to back you up. And so maybe that sounds like an okay thing, but it was a major reversal of policy where the Department of Justice policy, consistent with the Freedom of Information Act, always up to that point had been, you release things if you can, and you only withhold them if you have to. And even if something falls within an exemption, under Janet Reno, the department policy was, even if you could withhold it, you should disclose it unless you can show specifically how it's going to cause harm. Well, that all went out the window, and we're still living with that, because after that, the department started a, a doing a number of things. Um, let me give you an example. Right in the aftermath of 9-11, of the government engaged in a dragnet of Muslim communities desperately trying to find out information of the attacks and whether there was another attack coming. Uh, and in, the, in just a matter of a few weeks, um, in the course of doing that, anyone that they talked to who had any kind of an immigration issue, they'd overstayed a visa or they were here on a visa that they shouldn't have had, they were arrested for the immigration violation until the government could figure out what to do. Um, and within a matter of weeks, there were an estimated 1,200 people being held secretly um, uh, just as a result of this FBI um, talking to people in the Muslim community. Most of them were Muslim, uh, Muslim men. Um, and they were held in prison on immigration charges, not on criminal charges, although the department claimed that this was part of a criminal investigation. The fact is, there was only one person out of that 1,200 or so that were rounded up, whoever was charged with a crime, and it had, didn't have anything to do with 9-11, but the others were all deported in secret proceedings. Um, and we can talk about the, the proceedings in a minute on the constitutional access, right? But on the FOIA front, um, 
a number of, of uh, civil rights organizations, uh, when they got wind of this, went to the Department of Justice with a FOIA request saying, we just want to know the names of who you've arrested and when and where you arrested them, basic information. And in this country, um, we, we don't have secret arrests. We don't let the government take people and arrest them secretly. In fact, um, that goes back to the days of the abolition of the Star Chamber in 1641. From that point forward, it's been kind of a fundamental principle that we don't have secret arrests because of the concerns that it will lead to coerced confessions and other types of abuses. In fact, the disdain for secret arrests was so great that in Federalist 84, Alexander Hamilton describes a secret detention as more vile than depriving someone of their life without due process. It just is a fundamental thing that we don't do. But in the aftermath of 9-11, we did that. And when the, these organizations went to the Department of Justice under the Freedom of Information Act to get this information, the department said it wouldn't give it to them, claiming that it would constitute an unwarranted invasion of the privacy of the people they arrested. Okay, we've talked about that. But also claiming uh, that it would interfere with law enforcement proceedings, that there were security concerns about all of this. Um, and in, when it had to justify that in the subsequent litigation, it said, well, disclosure, disclosing these names might deter the detainees that they'd rounded up from cooperating with them. Uh, and releasing the names could allow terrorist organizations to figure out ways to impede the investigation by knowing who we had. So that was, that was their basic theory. Um, but faced with this blanket objection and the refusal to give out the information, um, District Court Judge Gladys Kessler in the District of Columbia um, ordered the department to release the names and the basic information of where they were arrested and when they were arrested. Um, and by the time that the case actually was being litigated in front of her, it was almost two years later, and she basically said the government's theories about letting this information out, interfering with their investigation, at this point, two years after the fact, is just impossible, imp uh, implausible. So she ordered it released. Um, and she took the government's task for, for claiming that they needed to do all this because these people had some connection to terrorism without giving her one shred of evidence that anyone who had been rounded up had any connection to terrorism. So she just basically found the position uh, ill-advised and illegal under the Freedom of Information Law. And so she rejected the demand for secrecy. Um, but her disclosure order was short-lived. The, the Court of Appeals pretty quickly reversed her and took Judge Kessler to task for second-guessing the executive branch on an issue of national security. What this, the Court of Appeals said is so long as there was any rational connection between the information that, that was to be disclosed and a legitimate law enforcement function, the information should be withheld. And I, I mention this case because this, I think, uh, is, highlights one of the keys to the problems we have is courts that don't institutionally know quite how to deal with these competing claims. And the Court of Appeals saying, we just have to defer. Um, but it's a significant concern, and it's creating a lasting restriction on the right of access to FOIA, FOIA through this lack of institutional, what I'll, I would call institutional um, uh, confidence. Uh, courts feeling like they're unable to, do, to differentiate between legitimate and realistic concerns about national security and public safety and separate those from the speculative, the implausible, or the openly illogical. And these are the types of excuses that too often we get from um, uh, agencies. And I can just give you another example of, of, uh, of those types of problems. Um, Carol Rosenberg, a reporter for the Miami Herald, who's covered all the Guantanamo hearings, um, recently uh, submitted a FOIA request to the Department of Defense wanting to know um, a couple of pieces of information about Camp 7. Um, Camp 7 is the the, the place at Guantanamo where they keep the, what they call the high value detainees. These are the people who the CIA had held and they were brought to Guantanamo and put in this special security facility. The facility was only built five or six years ago, but apparently it's already crumbling. Uh, and the Department of Defense went to Congress earlier this year and testified about what bad shape it's in and wanted $60 million to rebuild Camp 7. Well, this raised a lot of questions with Carol, who's been going down there all the time. So she submitted a FOIA request asking for just two simple pieces of information. Who built Camp 7 and how much did you pay them? Because she wanted to know why we were paying $60 million for a jail that didn't even last six years. And the answer came back, national security. We can't tell you. 
the information is classified. And when that was litigated in the court, the um, government puts in a classified affidavit that goes to the judge who reads the affidavit and says, well, it's classified information, you can't get it, and that's the end of the story. Um, there's, a, there's a real problem. Uh, and it's not just at the national level. Um, I can give you another example. A ProPublica reporter um, was doing a, a, a story about something. This is something known as an, a Z, like zebra, Z backscatter van. Um, it's a technology that's been developed uh, uh, that uses like a, an X-ray technology that sprays radiation in a manner that allows uh, uh, someone using this particular device to see through walls. You can drive up to a building and see what's on the other side. You can drive up next to a car. Here you see an example of it being used that it, it goes through the walls, right? So it can be used by law enforcement to detect bombs. Uh, it finds organic material. It could tell if a car was filled with drugs. Um, so it's useful for law enforcement. It's also very dangerous. It's a technology that's been banned from airports. It's similar to what they do with those things, but it's a different technology. It's been banned in Europe because it's too dangerous. Even in the United States government, the Customs and Border Control uh, is allowed to use them only if they, a, a vehicle that they want to use it on is empty. Everyone is required to exit before it's used because it's, it's dangerous. So Michael Grable, who works for ProPublica, found out that the New York Police Department had this particular equipment and was using it. And he submitted some FOIA requests for basic information. Have you done any health studies? Do you know what, what the health risks are? How much did you pay for them? How much you know, is the city of New York paying for this technology? Um, what sort of procedures do you have in place you know, to keep it from being used where civilians are or where people are? And what kind of privacy protections do you have? Because as you all know, using this at the airport, you can see through closing with it. So he's like, do you have any rules that say you know, that who can, who can have access to this and what they can do with it? And what did he get back? He got back a, a, a blanket objection from the New York City Police Department that disclosing this information would interfere with their ability to fight terrorism. What they said is, if we tell you anything, if we tell you the health risks, if we tell you how much we paid, it will disclose how powerful these things are and it will make it easier for the terrorists to evade detection. So we're in a situation where this risk of national security and the claims of terrorism uh, are being used to deprive the public, the American people, of critical information about what their government's doing, how it's affecting their health, how much money we're spending on it, what sort of privacy protections are in place, things that we should have the right to know, period. And national security is the, is the, um, is the lever that's stopping that. So let me just talk briefly, we're getting short of time, but so that's on the FOIA front. So we have those set of issues. In the, in the constitutional access right, we need to go back to Guantanamo again. Um, and, and let me just try to describe for you some of the problems there and, and it becomes really pretty Orwellian, right? Remember we talked about the, this conflict between classified information and the right of access that, that, that happens under FOIA. Well, you have a similar problem uh, in courts. Um, at Guantanamo, there are, are military commissions. These are war tribunals. They're not criminal justice courts. They're run by the military. Um, they're military commissions. And there are people who are being prosecuted for crimes for which they can be put to death. There's five people who are being prosecuted right now um, for being the masterminds of 9-11. There's one person who's being prosecuted for having planned the attack on the USS Cole. And these are in pretrial proceedings and the commission hearings are supposed to start next year or the year after it seems to keep getting put off. Okay, so a couple questions about what are we entitled to know about these hearings? Well, the first question is does the constitutional right of access apply to these hearings? And at first the department said no and we had a lot of fights about that. They've now gotten past that and in fact, uh, Brigadier General Martins, who's the lead prosecutor down, now, down there now, has kind of embraced the idea that the constitutional access right should apply. So he recognizes that the world will not accept as fair whatever judgments come out of those hearings unless they can observe what happens. Okay, so we're over the, the thirdle of the right applies. Now the question is, when is it overcome? And what do you do when information is classified? Now why is that important? All of these people who are on trial were high value detainees, um, which is a shorthand way of saying they were captured and held by the CIA before they were taken to Guantanamo. 
um, which means they were all subjected to what we call euphemistically harsh interrogation techniques, or what others would call torture, right? So the CIA takes the position that these interrogation techniques are classified, even though the president has now said they're illegal, that we won't use them anymore, even though a lot has come out. The Red Cross, the International Red Cross, has done a lot of reports about what happened. They've interviewed these people and published reports about what they say happened, where they were um, when these things happened. So there's a lot that's publicly known. Nonetheless, it's still classified. And to make it Orwellian, right, all of the defendants in these cases know that classified information, right? Well, you might think, well, they're not the US government. The government can't classify them, but the government says it can. The government says that what's in their minds and in their memories about their classified interrogation techniques is classified until the government declassifies it. So you have this dilemma that if any of these people take the stand at their trials, or even their lawyers talk about what they claim their clients went through while they were in custody, the courtroom, according to the government, according to, to the, the CIA at least, the courtroom would have to be closed because that's classified information. There's a compelling need to keep that secret which overrides the public's right of access. It's a very thorny issue. Um, there's been a lot of um, preliminary skirmishes about how do you resolve that conflict and who gets to decide that conflict um, that haven't come up yet, or haven't been resolved in the military commission setting yet, but they will at some point down the road. But this is actually really timely because this issue was just decided in, in one of the very first cases to hit it, hit it head on just last Friday. And I don't know if any of you saw this, but it raised the exact same issue. One of the Guantanamo detainees, I think, yeah, uh, a guy named Abu Diab, a Yemeni, um, who has been held in Guantanamo since the beginning almost, um, who has been cleared for release about three and a half or four years ago. There's no reason to be holding him. The government agreed that, that he's not a terrorist. He was swept up and he shouldn't be there. But he's still there along with 80 or 90 other detainees who are still there who've been cleared for release because no one will take them back. He's a Yemeni and the one country that, that the president is prohibited from sending anyone to is Yemen and they can't find any other country that'll take him. So he sits there even though we don't want him, he shouldn't be there and he doesn't want to be there. So many of these detainees went on a hunger strike that you may have read about. And for a while, we got a lot of information about the hunger strike, and then the government stopped giving it. They stopped giving their daily reports on that. But um, Mr. Diab um, finally went to court last spring. Uh, he brought a habeas proceeding, which is the one thing that, that the Guantanamo detainees are allowed to do to get into federal court to claim that certain rights are being violated. So he went to the district court in the District of Columbia with a habeas proceeding, and he basically said these, um, procedures, the force feeding, that they, they pull us from our cells, they drag us to this force feeding chamber, and they um, force feed us. That It's a violation of international law. It's cruel and inhuman. It violates our constitutional rights the way they do it. It's so painful. He asked a judge to order the government to stop the force feedings. Okay, well, we're not going to try to resolve that, whether that's a good claim or not. But he made this claim in court, right? So now, You've all been through this lecture, you know that what happens in a federal court is subject to the constitutional right of access. But where the story gets really interesting is in the course of litigating that this spring uh, and the claim that what the government was doing was cruel and unusual, the government disclosed to Mr. Daib's lawyers that they had videotapes of all the force feedings. The lawyer said, oh really? Well, we'd like to see those. And they had a fight about whether the government had to give them the videotapes. The judge finally said, no, of course you have to give them that. It's evidence of, of the, what they're claiming is illegal conduct. So the videotapes get given to the, the lawyers for Day, Mr. Daib. What do they do with them? They review them. They mark them into evidence. And they present them to the court. They say, judge, this proves our case. And they submit them to the court. They're now court records. So back in June, um, about 16 news organizations filed a motion saying, First Amendment right of access. These are public records filed in a court. Their evidence is going to be considered by the judge. We have a constitutional right to see them. So this same issue that came up with the testimony of the defendants in the military commissions that hasn't been resolved gets, gets queued up in front of Judge Kessler. And the government, as you might expect, comes in and says, wait a minute, this information is classified. The president has the only one who has authority to classify information and he's the only one who has authority to declassify information. You judge have no right to make public information that the executive branch has classified. 
And then they go on and say, and even if you had that power, you shouldn't do it here because disclosing this information would have all these horrible uh, effects. They said it would reveal the inside of the, the chamber, which of course we have pictures of. Um, it said that um, if you made the videotapes public, uh, our enemies could view them. They could then contact the relatives of the people who are in Guantanamo and give them ideas about how they could more forcefully and successfully resist feedings by watching the videotapes. And it was that kind of level of harm that they were alleging. So the judge, and once again, this name will be familiar to you, it was Judge Gladys Kessler, who had the earlier FOIA case, has this case. And here she's confronted with this issue, which no court has had to squarely decide before in this context of the First Amendment access right versus a claim of classification. And what she said in the decision that came down on Friday was, first, um, I do have the right as a judge to do this. The president and the executive branch have no power to say what a court can do or what a court can do. We have separation of powers. And when a record is brought to court and it becomes a court record, the only one who gets to decide whether that record is made public or not is a judge. So that was number one. And number two, she said, um, I do, I do I need to, to defer to the executive branch on issues of national security, but I don't have to accept arguments that are not logical or plausible. And nothing I've been told, she said, I've reviewed the videotapes, I've read the affidavits, I've read them twice, and they're just plain implausible that harm will follow from the disclosure of these videotapes. So she's ordered them released. The one thing she said that could be withheld was the identities of any guards that were visible that they could be electronically wuzzed out for their privacy interests. We're back to privacy again. Um, but the question now is whether the government's going to appeal that. So now you have kind of the full sense of, of how this, this right works, um, what the rights are, what these major forces of national security and privacy and how they're limiting it. And now I don't know where I am. <laughs> Um, I guess I just wanted to, to, to say, you know, that I think that Judge Kessler's ruling was a significant step forward and that in terms of, you know, we talked about privacy. What we need to do on privacy is rein back in the notions of privacy to what we looked at in the common law so that it's not such an all-expansive thing and give more credence to the public's right to know. And in the national security area, what's really critical, and it's critical on the privacy side too, is the willingness of judges to be judges, to recognize that they're an independent branch of government and that they do have this authority and that they shouldn't accept arguments that are illogical or implausible um, when they're offered by uh, the president, uh, by the executive branch. Um, and let me just say too, I don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that the, the, the threat of terrorism is not real uh, or that they're not legitimate concerns about security uh, that require a reasoned assessment of the risk to public safety. But what I am saying and urging to you is that the reflexive impulse uh, that swept the nation after 9-11 to withhold any information that could possibly be used by terrorists is today, today denying the public basic information it needs to function if our democracy is going to function. Yes, we live in a terror-filled world. We still do. Um, but our reaction to that is... Um, is unlikely, I mean, we can't react to that by suggesting that everything the government does to protect us must remain secret, and that everything the government does that could be the target of terrorism must be close, cloaked in secrecy, or we have lost our liberty. It goes right back to something that Benjamin Franklin said 200 and some years ago. He said, those who would sacrifice liberty in the interests of security will have neither. And I fear that's where we are today. So. So there you have it, a quick overview of the legal framework, um, some of the issues we're dealing with, um, two major trends today. Um, I hope uh, that those of you, particularly those of you who are future journalists here, but really all of you, um, will recognize that and appreciate that the decisions about how to resolve these conflicts between what the public's entitled to know and what we're going to do to protect ourselves and what we're going to do to protect security are issues that you are going to have to decide. These are issues that are going to face us and that you all need to step up and take a part and be part of the debate. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. It just make you want to go out and file a Freedom of Information Act request? It, it does me. Um, 
Thank you, David. And we now invite you, our audience, to join this discussion. Alex and Casey, where are you? Back in the back. With, and they're getting their microphones. Um, and when they get these handheld microphones, they will be looking for you to raise your hand if you have a question. One of them will bring the mic to you. Please wait until you've got the microphone to ask your question because we're recording and we also want to be able to hear you. Now, in the interest of time and to allow as many people to participate as possible, we do ask that you keep your question brief and to the point. So I'm going to sit down here next to Dave and um, we'll see who's got the first mic here. Thank you. I wanted to ask, where does the privacy limits take place in terms of there, uh, Mitt Romney had his campaign and there was a situation where somebody videotaped comments that he had made and then they broadcast that. I mean, when you have a telephone conversation and it's being recorded, you have to tell the person somehow that, it, that the, I, that the conversation is being recorded. So where does the, where's the line drawn there? If I'm in uh, giving a speech or I make comments and somebody videotapes them and then broadcasts them for the purpose of trying to make me look bad for some reason as, as was the case here, how is that uh, protected? Well, the, the question you're raising is, is kind of a different issue than what we're focused on. It's kind of what is the scope of privacy generally? And there are, are various laws that deal with various things. Um, the video recording you talked about, different states have different rules. In some states, you can't do that without getting consent. Uh, in some states, you can. But it's really kind of a, a different issue that would be a much broader discussion about what extent should we protect privacy? I mean, you, there are a lot of issues, too, about what, what the government's doing that, that Snowden um, revealed in terms of surveillance and is that proper, which is a little different issue than our, what are we entitled to know about what the government is doing. Kim Nolan, managing editor, Global Peace. With the current uh, re resignation of Eric Holder, what do you think is the hope now of having the judicial department will bring these criminals to justice? What do you think, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> what do I think? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't think we know. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say, you know, President Obama came into office saying that his administration would be the most open and transparent in history. He, he was aware of some of the things that happened after 9-11 and the fact that people, you know, eight years out or nine years out when, when, the, when he was first elected, realized that we had gone too far. And he was going to open things up. That's what he said. The very first thing he did after he, after he took the oath of office was to sign an executive order mandating greater openness, right? And the problem we have, and particularly in the national security area, is that, that I mean, there's a couple of problems. One is that, that the, the, the intelligence community, I think, is, is very powerful uh, and very concerned about protecting these things. I think it's not um, a coincidence that the CIA still says a lot of things are classified even though they've been publicly reported because they don't want to be embarrassed, they don't want people to go to jail, uh, and there's reasons to keep that secret. So how much the Attorney General can do to change the attitudes of the CIA or the Department of Defense or other, you know, the NSA, other, other branches of the intelligence community, I'm not sure. Um, clearly he has a role in deciding uh, what cases to bring and, and what to defend in court. Um, but I don't have a, a, a great deal of hope that Eric Holder leave. I don't think Eric Holder was the source of the problem, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, for your journalism students, there's a movie coming out in four days called Kill the Messenger, Gary Webb. He exposed the Iran-Contra uh, crisis and um, unfortunately gave his life. Um, I'm in a position to tell everybody, as bad as you think it is, it's worse. Um, the presumption that there's a chasm between the Church Commission and Ed Snowden is not really accurate because uh, I take that personal. There's a bunch of whistleblowers that I've associated with, like actual NSA whistleblowers, Russell Tice, William Biddy, Thomas Drake, that were warning about this when Ed Snowden was in high school. 
And what the people need to know, understand and know that there's 17 intelligence communities getting about $70 billion a year. The NSA gives 70% of its budget to independent contractors, of which my former employer is a massive recipient. And we've tried for <coughs> decades, actually, to get this out, but you bet. Well, the question is, I want to thank you for, I, I've been warning Congress about uh, Executive Order 12333, uh, the Reagan Administration 1981 executive order that gives private companies these freedoms. And if you could explain to everybody maybe what Executive Order 12333 is and how it represents a, a threat. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that really takes us in a different direction, too. But I mean, what he's referring to is, a little bit of background without being too long, but you know, when the Church Commission was created, one of the things it tried to do was to, to um, it was targeted to do was to stop domestic surveillance. You know, during the Vietnam War and, and the Black Panthers and everything, there was an incredible amount of surveillance of U.S. citizens by the U.S. government in ways that people were upset with, particularly the CIA and other agencies that were supposed to be outward looking. So one of the things it did is it created these rules around surveillance domestically, uh, making a lot of it illegal, um, but allowing things to happen abroad that couldn't happen here. And particularly dealing with uh, interception of communications, there's very strict rules here about not being able to, to listen into communications and, and various ways, but those rules didn't apply abroad. And in 1981, President Reagan passed, uh, wrote this executive order, 12333, which set the guidelines for what the intelligence agencies could do abroad. The problem we have that Snowden woke everybody, you know, opened everybody's eyes to is that that distinction between domestic surveillance and foreign surveillance makes no sense with the internet. If you send an email to me in New York from here, it's as likely to go through London or Madrid or Montreal as it is through Chicago or Atlanta to get routed to me just because of the way the internet is wired. So the idea that the CIA could, without any legal restriction really, do massive collection of data in England or Spain or Germany, but it can't do it here because we're protecting U.S. citizens, doesn't work anymore. And that's a, that's a big problem. Yeah, Rich. Yeah, him, Rich. Hi, my name is Rich Neumeister, and I have a question. Uh, also, I want to say thanks to the reporter's uh, case in 1989. I used the Supreme Court briefs to keep the BCA from making public the records here at Minnesota. But I changed my mind 15 years later, and I worked on a law to where the BCA records now you can get on Internet because the private sector had them all. Mm -hmm. um, I've just, I do a lot of advocacy on both issues, open government and privacy. And I wanted to ask you this question. I was intrigued by your a new look and the concept of the Richmond case, which I'm familiar with. But how do we apply that <coughs> to the state level? Uh, as you know, the First Amendment and you know the due process, the 14th Amendment brings it to the state. And so I'm curious to know, uh, because it's an interesting concept, I would like to see developed here more so in Minnesota law, this new concept of, or the concept of you have a First Amendment right. Can you describe that a little bit more, other than the courts, but where it can be applied to other areas and what other states' experiences have been? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's actually a really interesting issue that we'll see how it plays out over time. I mean, in the courts, it's very clear, as you said, the, the First Amendment applies to the states through the 14th Amendment, and there's been a lot of litigation. John Borger, sitting here, I'm sure, has done a lot of it, enforcing the First Amendment right of access in the state courts you know, that you can't do things because the Constitution doesn't let you do them in secret. The, the lethal injection litigation that I mentioned is one way that, that's being brought to the states uh, and to, to uh, limit what states can do. But you have to think, you know, that, that this right, while it's really very powerful, it doesn't apply to everything the government does. You know, in my mind, where it applies mostly is when the government is using its power, uh, uh, bringing the force of its power to bear, on individual citizens, like in an execution or like in a criminal prosecution, um, or anywhere that the Bill of Rights says that people have rights, it seems to me the public access rights should follow. So trials, executions, other things. Um, but there, there have been um, other ways it's been applied. Uh, in New York City, about four years ago, there was um, a lawsuit that, that applied the First Amendment right of access to administrative proceedings. They, the New York subway system right, has an administrative process. If, 
if you play the radio too loud or you spit in the subway or whatever, they can give you a ticket. You don't go to criminal court, you go to an administrative agency and you either pay a fine or you have a mini trial. And the rules of that agency said that, that they could be closed and a lawsuit was brought um, by the New York Civil Liberties Union and it said, no, the same First Amendment right applies in this local administrative proceeding. That would be another example. Uh, the right has been used in California to compel um, uh, a state agency to give out the names of people who worked at certain government organizations who are gonna be voting in a union election on the theory that the union has to have a right to get the information uh, about who's gonna vote in, in the union. So there are ways it's been applied, but it's really, you know, I say it's, it's been 34 years since the right was recognized, and that sounds like a long time, but it's really a very small, I mean, there was a lot of litigation in the 80s and 90s just to establish that it really, that the court really meant what it said. Uh, and it was sort of state by state combat. The AP um, w took the lead on a lot of that. And it was just, you know, constant litigation to educate judges um, about what the rights were. And now I think people are just waking up to say, now it, it does extend beyond that. And how far does it go? So. Well, I think very much, I'm going to try that myself a little bit from my discussion. We'll see what the state and local agencies will start saying this election. Thanks very much. Uh, my question is, I know there's an exemption under FOIA regarding oil and gas reserves. Is that being applied um, currently in any kind of um, you know, with issues of fracking uh, in the news if, um, if journalists, reporters are having issues with that exemption trying to report on any issues involving that industry? You know, this is, this is a good question, and I have to say, I'm not aware of any like active litigation going on with uh, under there. What he's referring to, one of the nine exemptions, is that you can, uh, the government can withhold certain information about um, oil wells and discovery of oil. Again, it was, in some ways, it was probably who was paying lobbyists when the bill was passed. They got a special thing in the law. Well, I, I thought the story was <laughs> always that LBJ would never have signed the law if there hadn't been that exemption because of the Texas oil interest. But but no, um, true. It, it's a good question. I. I don't know that it's it's being applied in that way. There's a lot of litigation around another FOIA exemption in terms of industry control, but that has to do with um, uh, the bailout of the banks and how the Fed is propping up certain industries. Uh, and there has been litigation uh, over there's a, a bank regulatory exemption um, that the litigation has been pretty successful in getting that to be narrowly construed and say you know when the Fed you know, right in the, when, the, when the markets collapsed and everything was happening, they gave out like over a trillion dollars out in immediate loans in like two days. And the question came from Bloomberg about four years later, like, who got it? And, how, and, and what the Fed said, we can't tell you that um, because uh, people lose confidence if, if they know a bank is borrowing at the Fed window. It's a sign of weakness, and that's why we keep this all secret. And what the court basically says, no, you don't get to do that three years after the fact. We get to know who got the benefit. This was really a federal benefit that went to a very select number of people, and the taxpayers are entitled to know who got those benefits. So that's, that's being litigated. More and more traditional government functions are being privatized or otherwise outsourced to private companies. To what extent do you see this as a problem in terms of public access to government information when it becomes unclear who government really is and which functions are government functions? Those are both great questions, and I guess all I can say is that they're being litigated. I mean, there's been a number of lawsuits um, that I'm aware of uh, dealing primarily with um, private, cor uh, private jails. You know, the, the, someone will say, the state of Connecticut will say, we, we can't afford to build more jails, so we're just gonna send people down to Virginia because there are private companies there that'll do them cheaper than we can build jails here. And then the question becomes, what kind of information are you entitled to get from that company about how they're being treated, how much money's being spent, all those things that are being worked out state by state. But, there, but you know, I think the basic principle, at least in New York and the states that I'm familiar with, Connecticut, um, if a government uh, agency outsources a government function, the, the public's right to know that information would follow. Um, what's a public function is a little bit unclear. There's a, a I can give you an example of another case. There's a, a a professor at Harvard named Susan Crawford, who's an expert on uh, competition in the internet and cyberspace, right? She's very concerned because she thinks that the way that the regulators in New York um, are regulating the, the 
the infrastructure that's needed for the internet to work. The, you know, the, just the physical, so it's not the high tech stuff, it's like the cable, the, the conduit that runs under the streets in New York City, which have to be dug up and put in. And she just wanted to know like basic information about that because she's concerned that New York is becoming uncompetitive in the world market. The, the, the internet speeds are not as fast there, it costs more there, we're gonna be driving businesses out. She tries to get this information and what she's told is, we can't tell you that because if we show you where the conduit is and where it's aging and where it's not, it'll become a target for terrorists. So, so but that's one level. But to your question on, on that, the, the other problem that she had is that um, in New York, all of the conduit and all of the infrastructure uh, in Manhattan uh, is, is um, maintained and built by one company called Empire City Subways. Um, under a contract that they've had since 1891. There's a whole lot of reasons why they've never changed companies. The company is a subsidiary of Verizon. Um, so Verizon seems to get better service and get their things quicker. But, but my point is, so she wanted to get this information from Empire City. She said, look, if you're not gonna give it to me, Empire City should. Another way you can get that is if you look at the definition of a record that's subject to FOIA, in New York and in other states, oftentimes the definition of a record will be something that uh, is uh, kept or maintained at the direction of a government agency or for a government agency. So there are a lot of circumstances where private companies may be subject to FOIA requests through an agency um, because they're regulated in one way or another. And that's another way to, to get some of that. I think, unfortunately, we're running short of time, so we're gonna have to have one more question. We've got dueling questions here. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, this question really has to deal with blogger versus journalist. I'm kind of a, a blogger and I go to events and I write, I ask questions and sometimes I request press access depending on the event at hand. And I found that sometimes uh, there's a favor towards traditional media or how they're defining traditional press or media. And I've had these arguments and these discussions actually with people at the University of Minnesota. So they admitted me to a Condoleezza Rice keynote, but they didn't admit me to a President Clinton keynote. And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what, what is your advice for a blogger or someone who is more of a modern journalist? And, you know, the, the things that I always say is, I don't want to be a traditional writer because there's a, there's, a, there's a bias there, you know? And it seems like they ask questions, who are you representing? Well, if you say you're representing Latin Americans or if you say you're representing a particular group of people or a particular interest, you tend to give away a bias. So I always try to not give away a bias and try to say I'm just a citizen journalist. So how do you, how do you apply that to the law? I mean, how, what protections does the, does the blogger have? And if you are a blogger slash journalist, how do you best communicate and, and make sure you get access to events that are hard to get access to? You, your question raises kind of two different points. I mean, on the, on the one hand, um, in terms of access rights under the Freedom of Information Law, under the First Amendment, those are not press rights, those are public rights. So you don't have to be a member of the press. Uh, the press has no special rights uh, under those. They, everybody has the same rights. So that's, that's one piece of it. What you're really asking about is how, does, how, do, how do you deal with the need to allocate scarce access to certain proceedings, like some courtrooms where you have a high profile trial and they say, okay, we're gonna reserve 10 seats for the press because we have room for the public. Who gets those 10 seats? And those are difficult questions. They're really a different question than does the public get access? Um, you know, in some places people have argued uh, we should allocate access based on audience because that serves the public interest best. So the reporters who represent, you know, are, are distributing information to the greatest number of people should get the first call on the seats. There's another point of view that says, well, that's really not fair because that means that the minority view or the people who are who are thinking outside of the box or who have a, a different point of view uh, aren't gonna get into these events. And it's, it's a difficult issue, but it, it's a different one really than we're, and, and I don't know that there's an easy answer. So. And I think on that point, we have to close this evening's discussion. Um, I'd like to thank you all again for joining us here tonight. There are comment cards on the tables outside the auditorium and we encourage you to fill one out. You can also be added to our mailing list or visit our website, which is scylla.umn.edu, for further information about our other activities and events. We hope to see you in the future and that you will be back next year for our 30th annual Scylla lecture. Thank you and good night. <laughs>